In case there are any uh, visitors in the audience, I'm Abigail Thompson. I'm the director of the Cosmos program, and welcome. So uh, rumors have been flying around that the title of this talk is Math and Mitochondria. This is not true. Um, just because I'm a mathematician doesn't mean I sneak it into every single distinguished lecture. So I'd like to introduce our speaker now. Our speaker today is Professor Jody Nunari. Professor Nunari is professor and former chair of molecular and cellular biology at UC Davis. She received her PhD in 1989 at Vanderbilt and did postdoctoral work and at UCSF. Her primary research focus is on the mechanisms and functions of mitochondrial behavior in cells. Defects in either of these are associated with a number of human diseases. Mutations in mitochondrial DNA can cause diseases in, such as stroke, eye problems, deafness, and diseases of the heart, kidney, and liver. So quoting directly from her website, it is therefore not surprising that mitochondrial dysfunction has emerged as a key factor in a myriad of diseases, including neurodegenerative and metabolic disorders. One of her recent papers entitled Mitochondria in Sickness and in Health appeared in the journal Cell in March 2012. She's a member of the American Society for Cell Biology and the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. She's affiliated with three of the graduate groups in the College of Biological Sciences at Davis in biochemistry, molecular, and cellular and developmental biology. She is the recipient of the 2013 UC Davis Faculty Research Lecture Award, the highest award given by the UC Davis faculty to one of their own. We are very pleased that she was able to join us this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nunari. Thank you. <laughs> so throughout my talk periodically, can I call out the numbers and get the same yes. response as you did? <laughs> that might be fun. <laughs> Which one clapped really loud? Seven? seven. All right, seven, come on, seven. <laughs> That may <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that made me feel really good. <laughs> okay, so I'm Jody Nanari, professor here on this campus. Uh, I am a cell biologist, a card carrying cell biologist. Um, I'm passionate about studying this organelle that I'm going to talk to you about today, mitochondria, hence my title. I breathe for mitochondria. By the time I'm finished, you guys are all going to be convinced that you breathe for mitochondria too, because that's what we do in our bodies. So my interest in this organelle um, was kind of born out of an interest in evolution and how life itself on this planet was born. So I think you guys probably know or have learned in your biology courses that life as we know it started, or at least evolutionary biologists think, that it started through the creation of a progenitor cell. And key event in life was to enclose, um, a co make a compartment, make it a, a barrier so that we could determine outside from inside. We could, um, you know, kind of sequester really defined chemical reactions. This was the first event, we think. And that progenitor cell gave rise to what we know now on modern day life, which are three kingdoms of life on this planet. Two of which are uh, eukarya uh, prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, okay? And we know that eukaryotes have, uh, they're the most amazingly diverse forms of life. They are typically unicellular, in other words, exist as a single cell, although we know now that they can form these aggregate communities and communicate with one another in a very sophisticated way. They live in our bodies. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for these two branches of life. But we belong here, we're eukaryotes. And you can see that we're pretty different from these two um, in a number of ways. So those are prokaryotes, 
were eukaryotes. What happened to make us eukaryotes? Eukaryotes are much more complex. We are much more complex than our uh, prokaryotic sisters. Um, we can be multicellular, obviously. Uh, we have brains, we can do amazing things. Um, how does that happen? How did this happen? Well, if you look inside a eukaryotic cell, it turns out that even the inside is highly specialized in the form of membrane-bound compartments. In fact, one of the hallmark features of a eukaryotic cell is a nucleus that contains, it's a double membrane, that contains your nuclear genetic material, right? So here is a eukaryotic cell, and here is a bacterium, and you can see that they're bigger. They're much, much, much bigger. So the reason they're bigger, the scale difference, is they've expanded, we have, eukaryotes, have, exp have a greatly expanded genome. Our, the genetic material that we have is vastly more than uh, prokaryotes have. Now, all that added genetic material is what conferred upon us the ability to regulate in a highly temporal and spatial manner the expression of genes. Um, that's what confers development, to develop into a multicellular organism. But with that added genome comes an extremely high energetic cost, extremely high. You have to replicate it. You have to take care of it. Um, the, you have to transcribe it. You know all of this stuff. So to make this leap, to an expanded genome, what happened here? Well, gee, what do you think? It's the organelle I study. It's mitochondria. Mitochondria happened there, and I'm going to make a case for it. In the form of what happened here is two uh, prokaryotes got together. One engulfed the other and gave rise to what we are today. So that's just depicted here schematically, this event. And this is taken out of a textbook, Molecular Biology of the Cell, a wonderful textbook, where you can see this imagined uh, what happened. And we actually have really good evidence that this happened because these organelles that I study, the mitochondria, have features that resemble bacteria. We can, tr we can trace their genetic features. We have very good evidence that this, a so-called the endosymbiotic hypothesis is actually true. So they have very similar features. So here is a modern day mitochondrion. And what distinguishes it really from other compartments in the cell, with the exception of the nucleus, is that it has double membrane, two membranes, an outer and, inner, and, and an inner membrane, just like the prokaryotic progenitor that gave rise to, that, to this organelle, okay? And amazingly, it has its own genome, okay? So it still has genetic material. These organelles, the reason they're key is they're highly specialized, like bacteria can be, for making energy through the use of oxygen, so-called aerobic energy production, consuming molecular oxygen to create energy in the form of ATP. Now, the remarkable thing about this organelle is that, again, it has its own genome. And it's a tiny genome, tiny, small, but mighty. So here's the smallest chromosome. I think this is like huge compared to your other chromosome in your cell, this mitochondrial chromosome, which weighs in at, it's just, it's just tiny, okay? It doesn't matter what the, what the absolute size is. But even though it's tiny, it's jam-packed with information. It encodes uh, 22 of its own transfer RNAs, its ribosomal RNAs, and the remaining bit of this DNA encodes for proteins that are intimately linked to its ability to produce energy. Without these proteins, you're dead, okay? You can't produce energy, you can't live. So, the fact that it has its own genome means that it has its own replication system, its own translation system. And this organelle, because of that, is referred to as semi-autonomous. Now the semi part is really key here 
because even though it has its own genome, it can't exist on its own. It has been woven into the cell in a way where you can't take it out anymore. So both the rest of the cell and this, and this organelle, mitochondria and this genome, are so interconnected that they absolutely depend on one another, okay? Symbiosis in a, in a very real sense. And that's been key to our evolution too because, because they're so interlinked, it's a way for the cell to integrate its ability uh, or its need for energy with this genome. So in other words, to have this genome talk to this one. This genome is linked to the membrane, the inner membrane. It's on the very inside of the organelle. And it's physically linked to the membrane that makes the energy, which is absolutely critical. And so what's happened, okay, so you, everybody knows that you get chromosomes from your mom and dad, right? One each. And that's shown here, this is a female. Um, but the chromosomes that you get from mitochondria, the mitochondrial chromosome, comes only from your mother. And while you get one copy each of your nuclear chromosomes, this is how many copies you get from in, in every single cell. Huge numbers, okay? So it's small and efficient because the energetic cost of maintaining it relative to this big nuclear genome is small, okay? So it can be amplified. Many, 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 many copies all on the membrane that makes the energy. The organelle was greatly amplified. The membranes were greatly amplified. Hence, the fact that um, you can use it, and eukaryotes did use it, to make that leap in evolution. It was the absolute essential feature um, that made this step possible. So mitochondria are energy for us, and they allowed us to become eukaryotes with the complexity that we enjoy now, right now. So I love this quote. It's by a colleague, Nick Lane, who thinks a lot about evolution. And he says, and I believe him, that even aliens will need mitochondria. So if you ever meet an alien, you know it will have to have mitochondria. <laughs> Nobody thought that was funny. Should I call out a number? <laughs> no, I'm not. Stop. <laughs> okay, so how does mitochondria make energy for eukaryotic cells? How does it do it? Well, this is a simplified version. We eat. We eat food, and food is broken down through, and you, I hope you can see the, the background of this slide. This is the set of chemical reactions that occur in our bodies all the time. And this is a so-called intermediary metabolism. And a lot of students react to these pathways like, oh gosh, it's so boring. But you guys, it turns out that understanding how all the chemicals we make in our body, how food gets broken down, how everything is connected, is turning out to be key to understanding cancer and how to combat cancer. So I hope you guys aren't turned off by intermediary metabolism. It's absolutely at the forefront now. So you eat food, it goes through these pathways, and they're broke down um, and funneled into mitochondria in the form of really uh, high-packed reducing equivalents that get utilized in mitochondria through this amazing set of machines in the inner membrane called the electron transport chain. And at the very terminus of this uh, chain is molecular oxygen. So when we take in a breath and we exhale, that oxygen is going to the mitochondria in every single cell in your body. Most cells, some cells in your body don't have mitochondria. They become highly specialized, but it goes to those cells and it's consumed to make energy and carbon dioxide gets released in the form of ATP. ATP is a molecule whose one of the uh, bonds in that molecule can store energy up. 
And then your body takes that molecule and can use it for other things, to build things, like protein, for example. So we really do breathe for mitochondria, absolutely. Now, I just want to show you one of these fantastic machines that are in the inner membrane. So in our cells, we have tiny machines that we mimic in real life and build. So here's a, a close-up view of the electron transport chain. These reducing equivalents go through it. Electrons get transported, protons get moved, and then funneled into this amazing rotary engine, which is shown here. So it's literally a rotary engine that synthesizes here at these interfaces. So protons are going down this gradient. It's synthesizing ATP. Another one of these machines, I mean, we, we know these, a lot of these machines on the atomic level like this. Another one of these machines, the first in the whole process, is a piston that transports protons. So it's, it's pretty cool. So what happens when things go wrong? Well, you can get mutations in this mitochondrial DNA, this, this chromosome inside your mitochondria. And, and I've just kind of schematically depicted them just to kind of provide you with some insight into how complex mitochondrial diseases can be. So because this genome is in such high copy, multi-copy inside cells, you can get different mutational loads. So it's not like getting mutations in your chromosomes where the disease can be recessive or dominant and nuclear genetics is in play. The so-called cytoplasmic genetics is a lot more complex. So it depends, of course, on how many of these are mutated, okay, and how those mutated forms get segregated into your various different tissues in your body. And so for a long time, it was really hard to diagnose these diseases. But now, of course, we have very powerful molecular tools, and including the ability to sequence in very high throughput manners. And Luckily, these diseases are being diagnosed uh, more readily. But as you can imagine, um, mitochondrial diseases affect your body from all the way from the top of your head all the way down. And not surprisingly, organs that have a high energy demand are greatly affected in mitochondrial diseases. Your brain, mitochondria are central in neurodegeneration. Um, and in fact, in aging itself, uh, you're, it turns out that you really need mitochondria to hear well. A lot of deafness uh, is linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. Your eyes, dominant optic atrophy is one of the most prevalent diseases and it's caused by a, a mutation in a nuclear gene that, is, that encodes a protein in mitochondria. And of course, um, greatly affects metabolic systems like your pancreas causing diabetes, your liver. Um, it also is, is incredibly important for the uh, production of blood. And then, of course, muscles. Muscles use a lot of ATP. And so a lot of muscular diseases, muscular dystrophies, are linked to mitochondrial dysfunction and, and actually mutations in the mitochondrial chromosome. And then cancer, aging, neurodegeneration, those are the biggies, right? all involve mitochondrial dysfunction. So this is a really important organelle. So I'm going to summarize what I've told you already, and then in the last part of this talk, show you a little bit of fun data from my lab. So I hope you've learned that mitochondria are derived from bacteria via an endosymbiotic event. They're pivotal which that event and them are pivotal in the evolution of eukaryotes and eukaryotic complexity. They have their own genome, which is an absolutely essential feature. And they function, they, they function in a lot of different pathways, but they're best known for creating uh, a, their ability to create a proton motive force that drives the synthesis of ATP by that little rotary engine that I showed you. And of course, they're absolutely um, essential to human health. Now I mentioned this before, but this is 
This is what's really interesting to me in the lab that I run. They can't survive alone. They're semi-autonomous. They've been integrated into our cells in every aspect. And so one of the key questions in my lab is how have their behaviors changed? So we know a lot about how, for example, prokaryotes divide. Division is usually about wanting to segregate your genetic material, right? Well, how do these organelles divide? Do they use the same machinery? Have they evolved different machinery because there are many more genomes? These are the questions that we're interested in. And we can actually inventory how they've changed. So the progenitor um, chromosome encoded about 4,000 genes. And now we have 12 genes. And if we look back at that 4,000 genes, we know that some of those have been transferred into our nucleus. So some of those have been preserved for the most part, and our nuclear chromosomes carry them now. But many have been lost. <laughs> and in fact, there have been new inventions, again, key to this question of how their behaviors have changed. There's many new inventions. And when we now are able to take an inventory using um, kind of high throughput proteomic approaches of what's there, there's about 1,100 proteins. Again, only 12 of those are encoded by its own chromosomes. So the nucleus has an enormous input into the behavior of uh, this organelle. So at the very tippy top here is a bacterial cell. In green is the chromosome, and you can see it's, it's going to divide, and it divides in a very precise way. I don't know why these slides are cut off. It divides in a very precise way, right in the middle. Chromosomes move apart. It, the division site is put right in the middle. Two daughters are born that have, each have their copy of the chromosome. This is what mitochondria look like. Not like that at all, right? So this is one of the model systems we use in my lab. It's a eukaryote. It's a simple eukaryote. It's a single-celled. It's yeast. It's like you know what people use to bake bread and make beer and wine. So in red here are the membrane part of the organelle. It turns out this is the inner membrane. You can see nicely lit up. In yellow here are where the mitochondrial DNA is. And it's packaged in this beautiful structure that contains a subset of proteins and compacts it and is dedicated to replicating it and taking good care of it. And you can see that these chromosomes are spaced out within this structure that looks really continuous, right? So you don't get, you know, growth of a single cell to about twice the length and dividing down the middle. Rather, it's a, in a syncytium, we call it, all connected together with the chromosomes all kind of together. So this was the first clue that things had changed. And we were really keen on seeing how that changed and why. So it turns out that there are a lot of different activities going on here that give rise to the structure that you see kind of at, in a snapshot at steady state. Dynamics. So when we look at this structure in real time, it divides, yes. So division does occur, but it also fuses back together. Bacteria don't fuse together. Okay, this is a new behavior. It moves around, very much so, uh, and tends to move around using uh, force-generating proteins and structures inside cell, the so-called cytoskeleton. It's actively positioned. So you can see in this cell type, it's placed right at the rim of the cell, at the cortex, and that's not by chance. There's physical tethers that link that structure there and hold it there. And then uh, the nucleoids are somehow segregated like this. And this process here is key, right? This is a real, maybe that's what it's all about. And we still don't understand it, OK? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some work that we've done that links these two events, dynamics, the ability to divide and fuse, to the ability to transmit the nucleoid. And here's where we're going to get a little data heavy. Mitochondria are dynamic. How do we know that? Well, here's a snapshot again of that structure. And if you can cross your eyes, go ahead. This is a stereo pair. 
I love I love this part because I get to watch you guys do this. It's pretty funny. All right. <laughs> see, it's amusing. Can you can you see it? Can you see it? You can't. Who can see it? All right. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's really pretty. I guess the point that you get from this, you can get without crossing your eyes, is that at this instant in time, it's a one single copy structure. It's all connected. Now, if you take a slice of that, and we can do this with, my, with very sophisticated microscopy, which is a blast, you can take an optical slice of a cell. You can see that this structure is changing over time. It's moving around. And here, it's moved up to here, and now created a new branch point here through a fusion event. So that means it's two membranes. The organelle comes close together, the outer membrane fuses of it, and the inner membrane fuses. So there's all this machinery that's able to create, take two separate membrane systems and put it together. And here, you see a division event. So taking one single structure and breaking it apart. And in fact, if you look in our tissues, this is, um, this is a fish. These are... <laughs> This is a zebrafish that we can light up their mitochondria by making them a transgenic. And then we can look in whole fish, live fish, at different tissues at what mitochondria look like. And it turns out different tissues, they're pretty tubular, but different tissues, they look very different. And so this dynamic behavior allows them to adapt, okay? And perform different functions in different tissues. So here again is that model system, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which turns out to be an excellent genetic system and that we've used to isolate the genes that control the behaviors of dynamics. And their names of proteins you don't really need to know, but we can knock these proteins out. So create cells that don't have them. The cells live. And in doing so, change the steady state structure of this organelle. So for example, there's three proteins that are essential for a fusion of mitochondria. If we eliminate those, division goes on. So mitochondria still divide, and in fact, they're all fragmented now, okay? Which is how some people still view them in textbooks, not true. Almost all cell types have really um, dynamic tubular networks. On the other side of this equation, if you block the ability to cut it up, fusion goes on, and this structure, as you know, that's already really connected, connects up even more into a net, a really tight net, okay? So we know that one of the features of mitochondria is that they're net dynamic. And in fact, one of the phenotypes associated with affecting this dynamic behavior is you begin to get loss of mitochondrial DNA, which of course for us is lethal. For this organism, luckily is not, so they're easy to study. And so what really these events do is maintain the functionality of the organelle and maintain its distribution. So here, this is a whole, this, this piece of the cell you can't see, but there's no mitochondria over here. That's not good, okay? So you really need to be able to divide off a piece to be able to transport it somewhere. Otherwise, it's too big. And this turns out to be really important in a really polarized cell like a neuron, where you have a cell body and then a really long structure that has to move a long distance away to make a connection. Mitochondria have to get all the way down there. If you don't have division, you have severe neurodegeneration. That's been shown in now many models. So it turns out, in remarkable evolutionary <laughs> feat, that the master machines that do the work of dividing mitochondria and fusing them belong to the same family. And they're fantastic proteins. They're called dynamin-related proteins. And they're big. They're big. And they have an engine a GTPase engine. So they're hydrolyzing GTP, which is another molecule related to ATP that gives, that confers energy, okay? 
So they have this big GTPase domain, and they have other regions in, uh, on the protein that facilitate the ability of this protein to assemble into amazing looking structures. These are helical, long helices. And when they do assemble, that's what triggers the energy production, which is coupled to making this an engine, okay? Making it be able to do work, these machines. And that is what we think is responsible for the ability of these proteins to change the structure of membranes. So either divide them or put them back together, okay? So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the division machine. Here again is a yeast cell. We can label proteins, light them up with a, with a protein called green fluorescent protein. And you can see that that's the, that's the division DRP right there. And it's on mitochondria, it knows how to get there. And if you look at this one right here, that machine that you can visualize that's already assembled, that's where a division event occurs. So this is the kind of evidence that we obtained that led us to the model that this protein is the master regulator of the division event itself. If you can link something spatially and temporally to an event, it's pretty good evidence that it's involved in that event, okay? especially at this resolution. So we were really interested in how this protein works, especially, you know, how does it do the work of division? And this question here, how, why is this one dividing that site and maybe not the others? So long story short, the other two proteins that we discovered turn out to work together to target it to mitochondria that machine. So that machine, if it didn't have these two proteins, would be in the cytosol, just hanging out, not being futile. These two are on the surface of mitochondria going, hey, over here, come and do the work over here. And so they attract this protein to the surface, and then this factor here kind of co-assembles with this and pushes it to go. All right, so now you're here, divide and helps it build this machine that wraps around, physically wraps around mitochondria and acts as a noose that continues to tighten to divide the membranes. We've now been able to solve at the atomic resolution the structure of this protein. Here it, here's a model of it. Um, it's a dimer. Here's the GTPase motor domain, and the protein has a wonderfully long stalk, and at the base of this protein is where it sits in the membrane, okay? Now, how does it build the helical structure we know? Here it goes. We can model it. It's going to come around a turn, and this is what's key to the assembly-stimulated hydrolysis. By building that helical machine, okay, you come around the mitochondrion, it allows you to bring two of these GTPase domains, the motor part, together. And that's what triggers hydrolysis. So the mechanism, the trigger, is built into the structure, okay? Really cool. <laughs> and then we think, this is a model, that GTP hydrolysis causes a conformational change in the protein, like this, so that it tightens around the organelle. And that's what facilitates division. So again, another amazing machine. This machine, completely new invention. Completely new invention for mitochondria. So they divide in a completely different way than their prokaryote ancestor. And remarkably, it's a simple machine, and really the only piece of it that's stuck inside mitochondria is, is one component. Everything else is on the outside, but remember, there's two membranes. And this is really, really different from what happens in the ancestor. So the ancestor also builds a machine that's a GTPase, believe it or not. 
And, but that machine is on the inside of the bacteria, forming a filament that goes around. And in fact, there's a lot, of a lot of regulation in this machine, so it is built right in the center of the cell, as I pointed out to you before. And, and the chromosomes are positioned on each side, just like this. Now, an intermediate in evolution are pretty ancient eukaryotes, algal. And they have retained this machine, interestingly enough, but they've also acquired this new mechanism, this dynamic that I just told you about. And this is our cells, okay? We don't, we're not sure there's anything on the inside that's doing this. There's only this dynamic that we know of. So how in the world is that positioned? Where is the information that places a site? Is it completely random? That wouldn't be good for uh, the chromosome, would it? How does it happen? Well, amazingly enough, as biology is sometimes, it turns out that another organelle helps. The endoplasmic reticulum is the other major endomembrane system in, the, in our cells. It is the membrane that encloses your chromosomes, your nuclear chromosomes. And it pervades the cell. You can see that here. This is in green here, and it's really hard to see on this projector. But it turns out that a bit of the ER comes and wraps its way around the mitochondria. And that is what determines where a division site will be placed. Pretty wild. <laughs> Pretty wild mechanism. So again, that's where the dynamic is targeted. And this is a movie showing you that. Here's the ER. It's wrapping around the mitochondrion right here. And you will see, ultimately, that is where a division event occurs. That was unexpected. So now we change our model a little bit. So it's not just this dynamic that's doing all the work. It turns out that where the ER is, the, the mitochondria is already a little bit constricted. And that's where uh, the division dynamic is targeted and then works as a mechanic chemical enzyme to facilitate division. So what happens? How does this work? Turns out that there's a complex of proteins that come together. One is embedded in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. A couple of others are embedded uh, a few others in the outer membrane of mitochondria, and they interact like this across the membranes and create these contact sites, very stable contact sites in our cells. This is where a ton of biology happens at membrane contact sites. This complex you can visualize here. So we've labeled it again with a fluorescent protein, and blue is a mitochondria, and red is the ER visualizes a little spot where the two organelles come in contact and in fact that's where division occurs. So this complex is really important for division. Here's the complex, there's the division machine, it gets targeted right next door and you get a division event. So how are these related to nucleoid transmission? Again, here's a, t a movie of this complex inside cells, the ER mitochondrial tether Here's the nucleoids. What do you think? They're pretty linked, aren't they? So again, this complex forms on the outer mitochondrial membrane, between the outer membrane and the ER, the nucleoids all the way inside the organelle, yet they're spatially linked. So the answer is that the ER helps place the division site in a manner that's absolutely linked to where the mitochondrial chromosome is placed. So even though the mechanism is quite different from bacteria, the function of the mechanism, the function of why you place a division site is conserved to help segregate the genetic material. And that's what you can see here. Here's a mitochondrial nucleoid uh, where the chromosome is. This is where a division event is gonna happen. And it happens right there, okay? So, ER-associated mitochondrial division, it turns out, is a very new mechanism. And the function, its probably fundamental role, is to link the segregation 
and distribution of the org of mitochondria and the mitochondrial chromosome. So it's fundamentally different, fundamentally important piece of biology. And of course that begs the question, how are these contacts placed? Are there other functions of these contacts? Are they sites of integration inside the cells? So this is where we're at. This is the very cutting edge in cell biology right now. And I'm still thinking that there's going to be something inside the organelle that is the determinant of that, perhaps the nucleoid itself. Here's a picture of um, a mammalian cell like ours, and you can't see it, unfortunately. But these green dots that are going to start to form at the, all the contact sites are sites where cell death is occurring. So our cells die in a very active way, not in a passive way. Um, it's a very regulated process, cell death. It happens right at mitochondria, not surprisingly. And it happens right at these contact sites. So these sites are absolutely key to the biology of our cells. At these sites, we think there are microdomains where certain subsets of proteins come together that are key regulators of lipid metabolism, of cell death, and of course, in all of our cells, the ability to maintain our mitochondrial chromosome. So, in the last part, I hope I reinforce the idea that mitochondria are pivotal, that they've acquired new behaviors, that their new behaviors, though, are still serving the same purpose with the thought that they also serve the purpose of integrating these organelles into the cell. So they can't live alone. So involving the ER to help segregate the mitochondrial chromosome, having a lot of biology happen at these sites is a mechanism of integration, ability of this organelle to communicate with other cellular structures. So I'm going to end on that, and I hope you guys have lots of questions. This is the people in my group who did the work. I don't have to go through them. Always. Yeah, you've got to ask a couple questions, otherwise you can't have any ice cream. <laughs> yes. How, how is it studied? So, you know, where, where we are now is still a snapshot of where we've been in some ways in the form of the diversity that eukaryotes have. And so, for example, those algal, really, we call them ancient eukaryotes. They're obviously not ancient. They live with us. But they're frozen. We think they're frozen on the path of evolution. So they're, they're intermediates. And so we surmise from studying them how things happened. And just like we do when we inventory mitochondria in our cells, compared to what we think is the progenitor based on lots of sequence information, okay? Sequence, DNA sequence, RNA sequence comparisons with different uh, prokaryotic species. Does that answer your question? Great. It's a good question. Any others? So this is another really great question. He asked, if there's a mutation in mitochondrial DNA, how do we deal with it? Um, mutations are happening in your mitochondrial DNA all the time. Uh, it's a very oxidative environment inside there, and so it's prone. There are repair, active repair mechanisms that exist that, again, are nuclear encoded. So these are mechanisms that are imported in. Um, but 
you know, they're not perfect. So as we age, we accumulate mutations in our mitochondrial DNA. One of our defenses is that we have so many copies of it. And the fact that it behaves as a syncytium, you can buffer effects of mutations that way. But that was a really good question. Yes? How do you detect diseases that are caused by mitochondrial DNA? What do you look at? So that's been hard because they're so diverse. So a single mutation, same mutation in a patient, one patient to another, depending on the load, can cause a completely different looking disease. So that's been a challenge. Um, they're starting to fall into categories. And again, with all the sequencing technology that's available now, you guys are all going to be sequenced at some point. Who do, who's done 23andMe yet? Anybody? Do you know what 23andMe is? SNP mapping? That's fun. <laughs> But you're all going to be sequenced. Um, and so this is rapidly, this is really facilitated uh, diagnosis. There are active NIH funded projects on this, sequencing people. I didn't talk about that. So they fuse together. <laughs> Um, using the same kinds of machines, the same family of machines, these dynamic related proteins, um, we don't completely understand how that machine can be reconfigured now to bring two membranes together. Uh, that mechanism where the two GTPase domains come together across a helical rung in the case of division probably come together across two membranes two separate mitochondrial outer membranes and two inner membranes. There's two dynamins for fusion, one that sits in the outer membrane, one that sits in the inner membrane. And we actually figured that out by being able to reconstitute that event in a test tube and measure, it se and measure each event separately. That was fun. So that's what we think, how we think fusion. We, we're much less uh, much less more, we don't have as much mechanistic insight into that as we'd like. That's something we work on. So I think we'll stop the thank you again. Thank you.